Hi everyone, this is Tony Nash with Complete Intelligence. Uh, the presentation I'm about to show you is one that I gave to a client a few weeks ago, and I just wanted to share it with you. Uh, they wanted to know kind of what's happening in the world today, uh, the transitory nature, or at least the comments we hear about the transitory nature of events today, and what are kind of some of the sources and some of the impacts of, uh, I guess, the transition, the temporary state that we're going through right now in the world. I guess the question is, one of the questions are, uh, is, you know, is this in fact transitory? I think that's a good thing to ask and it's something that we'll, uh, we'll look at uh, a few times as we go through uh, this presentation. So of course, you know, central bank, supply chains, you know, other things are, are really impacted or really impacting the transitory nature of uh, the world right now. So what are the origins? So of course, this is we're still in the wake of COVID. Some people are still amid, you know, in midstream in COVID, I guess, depending on what is happening with the local and national government um, where you live or where you operate. But the COVID shock has really pushed politicians to be incredibly risk averse. Uh, many politicians are really afraid of kind of letting off of some of the COVID restrictions. That's not a political statement, it just is. We do really have some, some very conservative um, policies in place in many places around the world. I live in Texas, we're not as, as conservative uh, as many places, but when we look at particularly parts of Asia, parts of Europe, some parts of the US, Canada, and so on, we still have some pretty restrictive policies that really are impacting uh, the economics of households, of companies, and of their uh, their national government. Governments look fearful. Um, governments look fearful in terms of, uh, say, the cash distribution policies or the central bank policies or industrial policies that they have right now. Uh, as we look, uh, as we saw, say, at the COP meeting in Scotland um, recently, uh, the developed nations wanted to uh, push on, say, coal and the the, the source materials uh, and the restrictions that, say, all countries, including developing countries, could use. And there was pushback from places like India and China for feedstocks like coal. So, so we are seeing some pushback there uh, and some of the, let's say, agenda items that people had wanted in the past. Uh, we're seeing a, a little bit of pushback on those because of the conservative nature of some of some governments. Um, the risk aversion at the government level has led to risk aversion at many corporate levels and in many supply chains. So, of course, we've had production uh, issues in semiconductors is obviously the biggest one that many people know about, but we've seen that throughout the supply chain. It's affected everything up and down the supply chain, as we, as, as we all know and what, know well. Um, and of course, that's led to inflation. When we have a limited supply, we have uh, inflation issues. Uh, we also have at the same time or up until say uh, earlier this year, we had governments pumping a lot of money directly to consumers, directly to citizens. We now have a lot of that really through uh, monetary policy. But when we had money going directly to consumers, we had more cash in say bank accounts, really pushing prices up and we're still feeling the impacts of that. So, you know, a lot of this is coming at a time when we should probably be a little bit concerned. We're seeing uh, the uh, environment and the economic indices, many of these kind of top level uh, indices looking at economic changes start to turn down. We saw a lot of upward uh, impact on economies as um, governments were pushing cash in, but we're now seeing that stuff turn over. We're seeing that as markets kind of uh, reach a, a top level or at least kind of try to figure out where they want to sit on the equity market side. As we see some of the, um, say, industrial metals um, start to stabilize a little bit, although we've seen some uh, quite a lot of inflation earlier this year. Um, but we are seeing some of these uh, economic, broad economic indices really turn over. And when we look at things like uh, PMIs, of course, uh, PMIs are turning over as well, and especially industries like automobiles, where we've seen impact from semiconductors and other uh, other materials. Uh, we've seen the broad autom automobile PMIs really turn down. Um, of course, uh, a fair bit of that is from the supply chain and supplies generally, but part of that is because of labor. We've seen 5 million people in the United States 
uh, fall out of the workforce uh, through COVID. Uh, so um, will those people come back? Maybe, but it's going to take uh, time. And that's part of why we're seeing wage pressure because we've seen 5 million people fall out of the workforce. We're trying to attract more people in uh, to do the jobs that, that those 5 million people had done. And, uh, you know, it's not just the developed world that's hurting. Of course, China is hurting. China's the second largest economy in the world. We've seen uh, the National um, National Bureau of Statistics PMI in China turnover. Um, it's very difficult in China right now. And with both in terms of the supplies, with winter coming uh, for food, uh, for energy, uh, and for raw materials for manufacturing. Keep in mind, we have the Lunar New Year uh, in the first quarter. So there's typically manufacturing running up to say mid January or something. So there still are a lot of materials imports that China's trying to source. Um, but at the same time, we see factory inflation rising. If you look at the, uh, the chart on the right hand side of this, we see factory inflation rising. So that red line is, is producer price inflation. Um, that consumer price inflation, the white line hasn't risen as much. Um, there is pressure for CPI to rise. And so we should expect in the near future for, for that CPI number really to push up a little bit uh, in China as Chinese consumers um, start to feel the pinch of, of some of this inflation that we've seen over the past, uh, uh, say, half a year, nine months. Um, one of the big problems we've seen in China, and this is very well known, is the electricity generation and the brownouts, blackouts, rolling blackouts for factories, which is hurting exports and hurting supply chains. So if we look at this left-hand chart, there is a real discrepancy between uh, the coal uh, supply and the coal demand. Um, actually, sorry, the electricity consumption and the coal output. So typically we have them kind of in the neighborhood. There's, there's a little bit of over and under supply of coal, but in generally those things balance out. We see a, a real yawning gap between the demand uh, for electricity and, or electricity consumption and the coal supply now. And we've seen in recent months, Russia come in with some coal supplies, uh, but still um, there is a, a very tight supply demand um, uh, meeting uh, uh, and there will be through the winter in China. So it, the, those coal supplies are tight. Those feedstocks generally are tight, whether it's nat gas or other feedstocks, um, but it's really felt most acutely in coal. And why is this happening? Well, if you look at the right-hand chart, we have a huge amount of uh, power demand in China right now. This year, it's risen very, very fast. So with the rapid power demand rise, we have a rapid need for coal um, for China's power plants. So uh, what happens with coal and PPI? Well, as coal prices rise, we naturally see PPI, PPI rise as well. So producer prices, even though they've been fairly high in China, they're not necessary, they haven't necessarily risen to uh, the, the cost of coal. So we there is potentially more upside for PPI in China. Um, one of the places that China could source coal that they haven't because they took themselves out of being a customer is Australia. Because of a diplomatic spat between China and Australia late in 2020, uh, China cut off uh, Australia as a supplier in January of this year. So um, these dark lines that you see on the right hand side are the composition of Australian coal in China's overall coal supply. Um, I don't necessarily believe the, the light blue lines that we see going toward the end. Of course, Russia has come in in the past couple of months, but I think it's been very difficult for China to, to, to source coal elsewhere. Um, so I don't necessarily think those lines have are as high as they um, as are represented because China is missing Australian coal and because we've seen the rolling blackouts at factories in China uh, in recent months. So, um, you know, part of the problem here is we have deregulated feedstock prices in China, meaning the price of coal can rise, but the price of electricity can't necessarily rise. Now, over the past couple of months, of course, we've seen uh, the central government and provincial governments go in and say, we can have higher power prices for certain industries, exporting industries, other folks, and there's a little more flexibility in those retail power prices. 
but again, they haven't kept up with the price of coal. Um, so there is still impact on the power sector in China. And we, again, we expect that supply demand balance uh, for electricity in China to be very, very tight through the winter. So electricity, of course, isn't the only issue uh, with rising costs both in China and elsewhere. For China specifically, because they do so much manufacturing, industrial metals prices are a huge factor. So as we see here, aluminum broke through the $3,000 uh, level earlier this year. Uh, it, it is a factor, it's a major factor, it's a major um, kind of industrial metal as you know, we saw copper rise earlier this year and other industrial metals rise earlier this year. Those are all factors to rising producer prices. Um, for China's exporting industries, uh, container prices, as we all know, container prices are rising. I guess we all know these things are rising, but to see the magnitude at which they're rising uh, is impactful. So um, that's why I have the chart here, so that we can understand the rate at which container uh, freight rates are rising much, much faster than we've seen over the past decade. Uh, so, um, so that's a you know a huge component of. Uh, say consumer price rises in the U.S. and Europe and elsewhere uh, that aren't necessarily seen for Chinese manufactured goods in China. For the U.S. specifically, um, I think the Long Beach port issues, we all know about the Long Beach port issues, uh, but I think, again, the magnitude and duration of those port issues uh, are something that uh, we really need to see visually to understand the impact it's had. Um, the previous uh, port congestion in 2015, of course, made headlines and, and hurt supply chains, but it's much, much worse now, and it's much uh, longer in duration than it is now. Uh, on top of that port congestion, we look at trucking rates in the U.S. So again, it's the, it's the uh, fastest rate at which we've seen trucking prices rise in decades. So that light blue line is the CAS uh, truck freight rates uh, in the U.S. and it's it's rising very very fast right now for several reasons. Part of it is a regulatory uh, issue for um, individual drivers, individual commercial truck drivers in in California. Part of it it has to do with the port. Part of it has to do with COVID restrictions uh, and several other things. So so all of those are culminating for higher uh, domestic trucking rates in the U.S. So what are um, companies doing as a result of this. So are companies necessarily compressing their margins and absorbing this? So as we look at this, uh, small businesses, this chart on the left-hand side, small businesses are not absorbing these necessarily. They're planning uh, on much higher prices uh, going forward because they just, I'm sure in the first few months, they tried to absorb it anymore. They just can't absorb it. So we're seeing a dramatic rise in uh, pricing expectations for small and medium-sized companies. Um, and then as we look at retail sales, this is the chart on the right-hand side. Uh, American consumers really have uh, accepted a lot of these price rises, okay? And they, they accepted them very, very quickly in the first quarter of 2021. Uh, and we continue to see price rises with things like uh, gasoline, with food, uh, especially say meat um, and some vegetables and other other baked products. So um, we're seeing that uh, continue to rise. But American consumers retail sales have really kind of plateaued at some point. So um, we don't necessarily see. American consumers willingly accepting the price rises as they have to date. Of course, nobody wants price rises, but um, they have accepted them uh, so far. But we are starting to see some pushback by American consumers because of the rapid rate of price rises. Um, so, you know, we do expect that to be a much more vocally discussed issue. So, is this transitory? Well, we hope so. We certainly hope so. Uh, we hope this isn't a permanent rise in prices. We hope to see some price falls going into 2021. Um, we don't necessarily think those will happen until, say, late Q2 or Q3 of 2021. We do think that we'll see elevated prices through the first half of the year. Before we go, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Complete Intelligence. Uh, Complete Intelligence has an artificial intelligence platform, and we forecast 
publicly traded assets in commodities, in equities, in currencies. We also forecast enterprise specific assets. So company revenues, company expenses, and so on. Um, with this, it's an interactive platform. It's an artificial intelligence driven platform. So if we can support you, please let us know. Thanks again for watching. And here are some additional resources that we have. This uh, PowerPoint is downloadable on the site. So if you have any questions, uh, let us know. Thanks very much.